in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. See, the hallelujah is very important because we are happy. We are filled with excitement and jubilation because this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is not just an ordinary thing that I get up here and do. This is the proclamation of the good news. And when we see the good news, we are happy and we're reminded, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, I'm not the best singer in the world, but I can sing that song. <laughs> and you can too. There was a time when I didn't go to church on a regular basis. I grew up in a church, but when I went to college, and for years after that, I did not go to church. And there were things that people who went to church did that kind of irritated me, rubbed me the wrong way. You ever meet somebody and they want to know, are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? And part of me, and my intellectual, intellectualization says, how do you know that you're saved? What do you mean you're saved? It's sort of arrogant. Are you saved? Well, are you saved? I don't know. That's another sign. But then there's this other thing. You ever hear people say that you must be, that we are, must be in the world, but not of the world? You ever hear people draw this, di this, uh, this, this, this dichotomy between people of God and people of the world? That always rubbed me the wrong way. But then, I read the scripture today. I read the gospel today. And Jesus himself said, I am praying for these people. I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for the people that you've sent me on the road. This is Jesus saying this. This is not just something that church folks made up. And so I started thinking about the whole concept of the world. And we talked about this a little bit last Sunday. The concept of the world is very, very important. When Jesus speaks about the world, the Greek word is cosmos or cosmos. The world is a perspective, it's a worldview, it's a way of looking at who we are. The world, being in the world. See, a worldly view can be very dangerous. I'm gonna tell you a story. And George Nicole, this might seem familiar to you, but bear with me. There was this man in Africa who had this big, beautiful farm. And he was the, one of the wealthiest men around. And then a priest from the east came to visit him and told him about the, these things known as diamonds. He's like, you know, you, you were wealthy, you got a nice farm, but there are these things called diamonds, and they're so important that all the royalty must own a diamond. The bigger the diamond, the bigger the king, and the bigger the kingdom. If you had a diamond, you could probably own the whole county. If you had a lot of diamonds and some really big diamonds, you could own this whole nation. And kings and queens will have to come to you to get diamonds from you. That's how important diamonds are. And so the farmer listened to this man. And at the end of the evening, he went to bed a poor man. That's the word. He was a rich farmer. But then he heard about this thing that he didn't have. And he felt this great emptiness, this great feeling of lack, like, oh, man. You know, it's kind of like, let's say you got a nice size house. And then they build a house that's just a little bit bigger than your house across the street. You're like, oh, I don't like my house anymore. My house is little now. That's worldly thinking. That is the thinking of the cosmos. Part of that thinking is sort of, we are here, and God is somewhere far away. And God, with one of his agents, has this piece of paper, and they're looking at our lives. And they're writing down all the things we did wrong. And we got to do enough stuff right and not enough things wrong to get into heaven. And at that last day, we'll be met by St. Peter or someone else. And they'll open up. They'll open up our book and see all the things that we've done. And we either failed or we didn't. That's the cosmos. It's like we got to do more and more and have more and more. That's the cosmos. So this is what I think happened. I believe that God 
created us out of love and gave us a paradise. And then God looked at us and said, man, why are they messed up? Why are they so stressed out? Why are they missing the entire point of this beautiful exercise that I've given them? I think Jesus came to fix that. You know, many people have jobs or situations. Let's say you have a job. And your company was an idea four years ago. And the idea is to make a certain amount of money, this is a good idea to work. And then here you are, grinding away and grinding away to make this organization continue to work. In exchange, you get a salary, okay. But you make it all this stress, all this personality stress, all this conflict between you and your coworkers. Why? Wow. That's the cosmos. That's the feeling that this material stuff that we either have or we don't have is who we really are. And that's what Jesus came to tell us. That is the word. God said prophet after prophet after prophet to tell us that we were already in paradise. All we had to do was to treat each other well. That is the word that Jesus has to come to tell the people. That's what Jesus is telling us. Look at it. Look at, look at, his, look at his disciples. Do you remember James and John? The two brothers, the sons of Zebedee? Do you remember those two guys? The sons of thunder. They were zealous. They were radical. They were filled with energy. And they said, hey, Jesus, when you come into glory, when you come into power, save a place for us, for me and my brother. One at your right hand and one at your left. Because we want to be important. We want to be more powerful than everybody else. We want everybody to know that we are in your inner circle and that we are more important than the other disciples. That's the cosmos. That's the world. That is that frame of mind, that is that mindset that I have to be better than you. I have to be bigger than you and you have to know it and you have to recognize my greatness. And if you don't, I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to take some stuff from you. I'm going to rip you off. I might go to war with you and take some of your material belongings just so you know that I'm number one. That's the cosmos. That is that world view that Jesus came to address. And even, even when it's right in front of us, when, even when it's right in our face, we don't recognize it. It's right in your face right now. Do you recognize it? Thomas didn't recognize it. Jesus said, hey, I'm about to go on to glory. I'm going to leave you. But I got a place for you. I'm going, I'm going to the Father, and I got these dwelling places for you. I got mansions for you. It's going to be okay. And Thomas said, listen, we don't know the way. We don't know what you're talking about. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And then Philip, seeing this, chimes in, well, show us. Show us this Father that you're talking about. And Jesus is thinking, I've been showing you the Father. The Father is in me. I tell you what, when I leave, no matter what you ask for, if you ask for it in my name, I will give it to you. Jesus had to be a little disappointed, don't you think? He spent all this time working with these people and, and teaching them and performing miracles. Let me tell you about that rich man in Africa. That rich man in Africa went to bed a poor man because he realized that there was this thing out there that was much greater than what he had. So he sold his farm and he went all over looking for diamonds. He took the money he lived off of. And then when the money was gone, he realized that his life had been wasted. And he went to a tall mountain. 
and he threw himself off. Back at the farm that he sold, the priest came to visit and, found, and met the new man, the new owner of the land. And he saw this shiny thing sitting on his mantle. He's like, hey, that's the diamond. Did the first owner come back? Because I know he was looking for these diamonds. He said, no. No, I just walked over to the edge of my stream, the stream that runs through the property that I now own, and I saw this stone that was shiny. I thought it was pretty. So I just put it up in my mantle. He said, no, that's a diamond. True story. He was sitting on the biggest diamond mine in Africa. <laughs> the man who went to bed and polished had diamonds right on his property and never knew it. He was traipsing off all over the continent looking for what he already had. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know. I want you to know that there are diamonds that are in your possession right now. The cosmos, the world view, has blinded you to the diamonds that exist in your life right now. Jesus Christ came to tell you that there are diamonds in your possession right now. The reason why we don't see it is because we take things for granted. We take things for granted. We take our health for granted. We take our minds for granted. We take our eternal souls for granted. It doesn't get any better than those three. It does not get any better than, I don't care how beautiful your clothes are, or how big your house is, or how new your car is. There's nothing more important than those three things. And look at all those blessings. I'm asking right now to think about all those blessings that you already have, all those diamonds in your life that you are already in possession of. That's the word of God. That's what Jesus wanted us to know. Let me tell you something about people. God made them. God loves them, and you cannot get to heaven without them. Other people. Not just you, but how you treat other people. How you interact with other people. How you love other people. And when I say other people, I mean every other people. Every other person. I mean like the people that you may not particularly care for. Like people that get on your nerves. They matter. Your life matters. All that other stuff out there, all that stuff that you think that you need so much, I can't say you don't need it at all. Jesus spent time with his disciples, and over and over again, they were stuck with this cosmos, this worldly view, even to the end. And what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? It says right here in the text what he did. He went and prayed for them. He prayed that they and us would have eternal life. That they and us would take this world, this logos that he has given us and utilize it and build ourselves up and become strong. Jesus said, I pray that I will be in them as you are in me. Jesus said he wants us to have complete unity with God. Complete and utter unity with God. That is eternal life. That is eternal life. And eternal life begins right now. In this moment, eternal life begins. To live in God, to have complete unity with God. To see how beautiful all your blessings are. To see how beautiful all those folks in your life are. That's eternal life. You can begin it and own it at any moment. 
Brothers and sisters, you have eternal life. Eternal life is yours. I want you to rise up. I want you to elevate your spirits in this moment. I want you to think about all the things that you have and all the diamonds in your life that you have right now. Not just somewhere else, but all the things that God has given you already. You have eternal life. So that, that fall, that heavy mist that sort of blinds us from time to time, God is giving you eternal life. Just let it blow away. Let it, let it just get out of there. I think it's time for us to be joyful. Let us be joyful. Let us know that we have eternal life. Let us be jubilant in our joy. God is the mother of orphans. God is the father of orphans. Let us be the mothers and fathers of orphans because we have eternal life. Let us not feel separated from anyone because we have eternal life. God is with us and God holds us. God will take us from poverty to prosperity, from incarceration to freedom. Let eternal life begin today. Amen.